Kraken Pro is the powerful crypto platform for experienced traders who demand the best. With advanced charts, real-time market analytics, and lightning-fast trade execution, Kraken Pro empowers you to trade your way. Customize your setup and make every pixel count by rearranging and stacking trading modules in a way that makes sense to you. On Kraken Pro, you have the freedom to put your favorite market analytics and execution tools exactly where you need them. And whether you're a seasoned pro or just starting out, Kraken Pro has everything you need to navigate over 210 plus assets with confidence. Join the thousands of seasoned traders who trust Kraken Pro. Visit realvision.com slash Kraken Pro. Hi, I'm Raul Pal, and welcome to my show, The Journeyman, where I journey to that nexus of crypto, macro, and the exponential age of technology, the big mega trends that affect the life around us. I think many of you know that I think the work that I've done on the Everything Code in Global Macro Investor, my research service, but it's also on Real Vision uh, Pro Macro for those of you who are members there. And I've done as much free content as I can to help people understand this process. The idea that the central banks are understanding that we've hit the debt limit globally from all the major governments, and their main job is to do one thing, and that's debased currency over time. It's called financial re repression. And the idea is you debase currency so the value of your debt goes down. And also the value of assets optically rises, so the collateral, which is that, that base layer to any lending economy, is protected. Because if you lose the collateral that happened in the housing market in 2008, what happens is the whole house of cards comes down. So there's one game in town, and that's the Fed, the BOJ in Japan, the PBOC in China, the European Central Bank, the Bank of England, Bank of Canada, everyone's doing the, the same thing. And the aging populations exacerbate this because that has all the savings pools, so they can't let those people go bust either. That debasement has optically forced asset prices to rise. So what's really interesting, and again, I've talked about this at length before, is if you divide the S&P 500 by the Fed balance sheet or the our GMI Global Liquidity Index, what you find is the S&P 500 has gone nowhere since 2008. And nor has gold, nor has real estate, nor have global equities. I mean, basically all assets have gone nowhere. And that's the world we all kind of feel like we're living in. Yet we see these equity markets rising. And we're like, well, my income's not rising. How the hell's this going on? My business isn't booming. Sure, some businesses are booming, but most aren't. And that's the magic of debasement. It kind of is a wealth tax on you and you don't really realize it. <clears throat> so your wages don't rise, cost of asset keep going up. Within that whole process of understanding the everything code, I did divide pretty much every major asset in the world. I was using gold and copper, everything, just like what outperforms the Fed balance sheet? Where do you put wealth? Now, most of these equities, you know, S&P 500, for example, basically holds its value. So you're not getting worse off for that but they're going up more than your wages so you can afford less of them. So that doesn't help your future self because an asset is just future deferred consumption. But when I looked at the NASDAQ, it was like a straight line up versus the balance sheets. And it was outperforming the basement. And that got me down the route of the exponential age, understanding that technology is a mega secular trend. But beyond that, is the ludicrous trend of crypto. And crypto, and I've talked about this from every angle to try and get people to understand, is a life raft out of debasement. It's a new financial system being built. It's an entire network of the internet of value that we get to own a fractionalized share of, whichever country we're in. It's the same globally homogenous product. Everywhere in the world, we all have an equal chance of putting 10% of our paycheck in this massively fast growing asset. It's the fastest growing technology, uh, fastest growing asset class of all time in terms of number of people using it. It's the second fastest growing technology in history, only just been bettered by AI recently. But beyond that, it's faster than the internet. And it's like owning a share of the internet. That's the magnitude of what it is. It's currently a $2 trillion, $2.7 trillion market. I think this cycle, it ends up at 10 trillion on its way to 100 trillion, 200 trillion. That is a big fucking megatrend. 
with the debasement of currency, the adoption of a new system, and the fact that it's a life raft from the old system, <coughs> that creates this super massive black hole that sucks in capital. And it outperforms everything. It's the biggest macro trend and bet of all time, which is why I dedicate so much of my time to it. And on a risk-adjusted basis, it outperforms every asset. It's like an alien asset class. There's just literally nothing we've ever had before has had this performance with this little risk, even though it goes up and down to like 70 or 80% on the downside and then up you know, 10x on the upside. Still, on a risk-adjusted basis, it's the best risk-adjusted asset in the world. I mean, Urien Timmer from Fidelity produced an amazing chart which shows all of the risk-adjusted assets and then Bitcoin at the top right. It's like it completely doesn't exist in the same framework as anything else. So anyway, this massive trend is the reason I have this T-shirt. The T-shirt is don't fuck this up. And don't fuck this up is we are being given the gift. We need to take the gift. And the game is not to lose your tokens and not to do stupid stuff and not make money. I don't want people coming to complain. They debased our currency and we didn't make money from it. <coughs> we got poorer. No, you've got the opportunity. Take it. But making money is not easy and making money requires work. Um, and it requires work to get an understanding. It's probably why you're watching this now. Um, but also, you know, I do believe that you learn by being surrounded by smart people. I'm so lucky to be able to talk to some of the smartest people in the world. At Real Vision, we have this incredible network where you can connect with all these amazing members in like 121 countries around the world and talk to them about what matters to you, exchange ideas exchange trade ideas, exchange thoughts, meet up with each other around the world, that whole incredible spinning globe where you can just choose a country and go and find people who live there and talk to them about it. It's incredible. But also the knowledge that Real Vision provides and the tools that provide give you the chance to not fuck this up. It gives you the chance to understand what you need to navigate this journey and to profit from it. So I know many of you are watching this on YouTube and you kind of watch the plug occasionally for realvision.com and you probably haven't gone there because I don't know why, you just there's an inertia of doing it. But it's crazy. Honestly, it, there's so much that will help you. You will increase vastly your probability of success and it's free. So go to realvision.com and sign up for that. And while you're at it, Please also sign up for the YouTube channel because that just helps us make sure we get the best guests in the world because the channel's growing. Obviously, like and comment as well if you find this useful. Anyway, next conversation is with a good friend of mine, King Arthur, Arthur Hayes, um, King Arthur of crypto. Let's talk to him because he's like me. He thinks about it from a big picture macro framework and then drills down. And it's always a rewarding conversation. And I think you and I will learn something new yet again. All right, see you the other side. Join me, Raoul Pal, as I go on a journey of discovery through the macro, crypto, and exponential age landscapes. In The Journey Man, I talk to the smartest people in the world so we can all become smarter together. Arthur, good to see you, my friend. You too. Been a long time. I know, too long. Too long. Yeah. <laughs> Everyone's been busy again, right? Suddenly, yeah, right. we're making crazy. money. So, everybody, yeah, <laughs> yeah, got other shit to do. That's right. We've all got smiles on our faces, everything. Yeah. That's great. So, I love it. Um, as ever, well, firstly, tell us what you're doing now, just because you know you're working on new stuff. And then we'll just go, I want to dig in as ever to your kind of bigger picture macro framework, and then we'll come down into tons. So, and so, 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 what are you up to these days? So, I'm chief investment officer of my family office, Maelstrom. And basically we're a, you know, early stage token slash shitcoin fund. So <laughs> just my money. And there's four of us in total. Um, there's one guy who runs the book and we try to invest in stuff that we think is going to do all over the cycle with a different sort of mindset than your traditional venture capital firm, because it's all my money. I like to have more of the money than I have now. Therefore, like we actually sell things. And so it's a little bit different mindset than, you know, a traditional VC phone, which is LPs. And you're just trying to, you know, 
take all their money through management fees. So it's a it's it's fun. It means that we're able to you know have a different sort of um, investment philosophy throughout the cycle, and it's I, I'm loving it. Uh, learning so much about what's going on in, in crypto, it informs my views on any sort of like liquid punts I do and different tokens and coins. But yeah, that's what I spend most of my time doing. And then obviously writing my my blogs and um, being a troll on Twitter as well or X or whatever it's called religiously because they're always great. <laughs> so let's um. We'll talk more about shit coins and the general opportunities in a bit. Um, talk me through your big picture view. You know, where where are you now in thinking through this? You know, I think you and I share the same idea, this kind of everything code idea of of somehow somebody's got to pay for this debt issuance that's coming, stuff like that. So talk us through how you're seeing the world at a very big level right now. I think at the very simplest level, I believe, and this is my own sort of heuristic, that real interest rates and you know, Japan, China, EU, and the US are, are negative. And I define that as 10-year government bond rate minus nominal GDP. And once you step back from sort of your education and the, you know, relevant ism of whatever economic school that you went to or books that you've read, and you maybe take a look more in China, like GDP growth is literally just a number that the government can make be whatever they want. As long as you're willing to issue debt, you can get GDP to be whatever you want because you as a government can crowd out everyone else and spend on goods and services. Uh, and if you know if Biden needs a 5% nominal GDP, then he can do it. Just go spend the money. Same just like in China. And so I think people lose sight of that, that, oh, this, this GDP number is this sort of exogenous variable that just happens to happen because people do things in the economy. No, well, the government... If the government's willing to borrow money and they can borrow it cheaper than nominal growth rate that they're generating, then they're just going to keep spending money all day long. And so that, I think, is just powering all asset classes. I think classes. that's the big game, right? That's it. The big it doesn't game. matter. Everything it's, else is like... Yeah, how I think about it is, okay, in a massively debt-laden world, GDP is the thing that pays the interest on the debt. And as long as that's high enough, they just keep issuing more debt. Yeah. You know, I got to the fact that the government is, let's say, 100% of GDP in debt in every country except Japan and China. China's a bit weird. But um, so that's so if, if, if interest payments are at 5% and GDP is at 5%, then there's no money left for the private sector. So it all ends up on the balance sheet in, in the end because somebody has to pay for the interest on this debt. Exactly. And so I think right now, the authorities are doing everything they can to make sure that the rate that the government borrows at is below the growth of the economy. And how do they do that? They financially repress us through all the different things that people have been talking about. Banking regulations, um, the way in which markets operate. But this time around, we have crypto, which is the first time in human history where there's a way to easily opt out of the system. Obviously, there was gold in the past, but gold is heavy. It's really hard to move. And so like... If you're wanting to get a million US dollars of gold out the door really quick, you know, it's a process versus I can have a million dollars of Bitcoin or a billion dollars of Bitcoin or one dollar of Bitcoin and always the same amount of nothing. And so now we have this ability as citizenry to say, okay, well, you want to run that game? Cool, run that game. But my capital that I save is going to be over here and you can't tax it with inflation. And so I think that's the secular thing that's going on. And the, you know, the Fed and all these other central banks between like 2022 and probably a little bit of last year attempted to play the game that they actually cared about the value of the currency by trying to tighten things up. But it became very clear during the, you know, banking crisis in 2023 that anytime there's a disturbance, the Fed and the Treasury will step in and save the day. And you can think about any other major country, you know, BOJ today said they were like, you know, making things more tight. All they did was move, move deposit rates from minus 10 basis points to zero and still do QE. And people are like, oh, yeah, the BOJ is tightening. No, they're not tightening. They're still printing money. And so like everybody is playing the same game. And I think if you're you know, attuned to that, then it doesn't fucking matter. Like whatever the alphabet soup program that they come out with, it all does the same thing. How do I keep the mo money in the system? And so how do I get out as, a, as an investor? And that's, for me, is crypto... And that's why I think that this cycle is going to be insane and people don't have enough imagination for how crazy things can get. So for, it, for in order for it to be really crazy, we need some more alphabet soup, right? It's the cowbell idea. Somewhere, 
somebody's going to do something. Now, we've seen the US wants to tra- change its bag- banking regulations yet again, which kind of means banks have to hold more treasuries. That That's one way of not doing QE, but doing QE is finding buyers of this shit. Where do you think it comes from? Obviously, we've got the whole commercial real estate issue, which is a nice excuse for them to maybe print a trillion dollars. But where are you thinking this comes from? Banking reserves. Banks have $3 trillion of QE is sitting on the Fed's balance sheet. It was a perfectly great opportunity. Okay, no uh, capital charge for treasuries? Great, I have a great bonus. I'm, you know, 0% cost of capital, Five and a half on a three-year, three-month, or four, you know, four point three on a ten-year. Great, all carry to me. I'm not going to lend a single dollar out to a real person or a business, and I'll get paid a lot of money. And that's exactly what they'll do because the rules of accounting make it very, very profitable to hold government debt. And that's not just the U.S. It's everywhere in the world. It's the same sort of game that the financial regulators play. So does that mean we won't be using the Fed net liquidity number? We'll have to adjust it. To look at bank reserves as part of it, I think yeah. I think you know the QE game was so well known yeah. that they, they need can't a new game. Use it again. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> QE is a bad word. Even like your random person in the street probably knows that QE means printing money. That means that they fucked up. So they need a new a new way, some new esoteric way that the money markets function. I mean, even reverse repos is now probably like commonplace for most average investors. Who are like, who would have known? Like. 15 years ago that you have so many people talking about like how these, you know, esoteric, you know, caverns of the money markets work and this is what's ramping markets. And so as the internet is giving us all this sort of information and sort of real time transparency of what these charlatans are doing with our, our money and our savings and our time, they're gonna have to come up with a new name for this. It yeah, doesn't really matter what it is. that's all they keep doing. It's like, okay, you figured that bit out, so let's do something else so you don't notice yeah. that for a while. You know, we did it with draining the reverse repo, as you said. I mean, that was a another the classic one. And, you know, the TGA has been another nice one. There's been all of these nice little tricks that they've had. What about China? China seems, and you're over that part of the world. What's going on in China? And how are they, it feels like they're in a full debt deflation right now because of the real estate market. How are you thinking about that? So what I don't understand is the why of this, but put that aside. So in China... If you are the average person going to buy uh, an apartment, you prepay the entire value of that apartment before you get delivered the apartment. And so then it's it's a liability of the developer to then complete that unit. So this is the problem with the Chinese housing market is that they have a liability to the populace, which is, hey, I took all this money from you and I promised to build these apartments. And now... I don't have any access to credit. And so I squandered the money doing whatever I did over the last 20 years. And now I can't complete these apartments. And so then the Chinese person who's, you know, busted their ass to save up for, you know, some of the most unaffordable housing markets in the world. If you look at median disposable income to housing prices, Beijing, Shanghai, these tier one Chinese cities are the most expensive places to buy housing in the world. But people saved and did what they had to do to put down the money in full to buy these units. And now the developer is saying, hey, uh, I can't I can't complete these. So then what do you do? You have all this capital tied up in this house or apartment that's not going to be delivered. You cut down on all the other things, right? On spending. Yeah, of course, spending is growing in China, but not fast enough for the amount of debt that they've accumulated over the last you know, 20 or 30 years. So that's the issue. And the central government to date has not come with a solution that is addressing that problem because it's a very expensive problem to address. And, you know, the PBOC and all these economic officials understand that they've issued so much debt to onboard the however many trillion renminbi of building houses for all these people who will no longer get their house because these property developers went out of business. That's a very, very difficult political thing for Beijing to to solve. And so they're trying to do things piecemeal that don't really address the problem, which is why I think China is going to be locked in a low to no growth, low to low to no real growth situation for a very long point in time. And you know, you would probably Chinese bank and financial stocks are value trap. Are they going to have a financial crisis like a 2008? No, because it's a closed system, and the government can do whatever it needs to do to make sure the banks are in business because the government owns the banks. So I think China is just a value trap at this point. Not going to have a financial crisis. 
until Beijing feels that they want to launch a very aggressive stimulus program to make sure that these people get their houses built or buys these unsold units off of the property developer's balance sheets, again, very expensive, then I think China, you know, exists over there in the ether, but not really relevant at this point in time. Yeah. I mean, it just feels like it's Japan all over again, right? The same demographics, the same debt issues in many respects. And it just feels like the only thing Japan learned, the only thing they can do is monetary stimulus at various points just to keep it going. Because nobody wants the banking collapse because that's the end of everything. Yeah. So it's, there's not going to be a financial collapse. It's just going to be you know a flat line for a very long time until you know, whatever, maybe there's some political decision that they want to do like a 2000 and nine or 2015 style mega bazooka stimulus. Maybe if the Fed eases a bunch more, then they'll feel like, okay, we can ease too because our currency is not going to get trashed on a relative basis. So we'll go and we'll spend a much more money to bail out these property developers. And the US have to cut, right? They don't really no, have a choice. They're already, uh, it doesn't matter. I have, if you take a look at the, so obviously quantitative tightening, they're reducing the balance sheet. That's the net drain of liquidity. But you have, Interest paid on excess reserves. So there's three trillion dollars sitting in these accounts that are the bank's reserves. They're getting five and a half percent or whatever, five point four percent, whatever it is. On that, that's however many hundreds of billions of dollars of cash straight to the banking system. Anyone who holds treasuries, obviously massive amounts of short-term T-bill issuance. Wealthy Americans, wealthy institutions, banks themselves, money market funds. Again, a trillion dollar annualized coming out of the treasury. Reverse repos, again, another, I don't know what it is now, like 400 billion, still, it's a lot of money, more interest being paid. So if you add all those up together, they're net stimulating the treasury and the Fed, even when they have high interest rates, because the higher you raise the rates, the more interest you're paying out to wealthy asset holders. And so what do they do? I mean, I was in Japan for most of the winter, you see a lot of older Americans in Japan, there's more Americans in, you know, at these ski resorts than I saw mainland Chinese, it's kind of reverse. Where are they getting the money from? Janet Yellen and Jerome Powell. So I think the this but what about on the, the, on the debtor side of the balance sheet? So look, I mean, none of the tech companies have debt, so it's irrelevant to them. They all earning the interest, so they're super happy. There's a bunch of old economy stocks, the eighteen Ts of this world, that are pretty fucked in this environment. Households seem to be all right because they have locked in mortgages, so it doesn't really affect them. So how about that debtor side? Well, I think even in the corporate balance sheet, I forgot the chart. I think Jim Bianco keep publishes it periodically, like the net amount of interest payments, like the net receipt is rising as interest rates go up because of all these corporates on, on an aggregate basis. Obviously, there's the at and of the world and the General Electrics that are fucked. But on an aggregate basis, corporate America loves higher interest rates. It's like, you know, it's like a Berkshire Hathaway. What does it make? Like $100 billion last year in interest? Like, it's just insane. Or something crazy. Maybe it's not $100 billion, but some obscene amounts of billions of dollars that Warren Buffett made sitting on his fat ass doing nothing, drinking a Coke. It's like, thank you very much, Janet Yellen. So <laughs> <laughs> I, I I don't I just I do not believe this notion that a five and a half percent rate is restrictive. It is not because of all the different ways they have to pay people to make them not lend. Right? Why do they pay interest on excess reserves? Why is a reverse repo? Because the Fed wants to fix the price of money. The only way they can do that is they have to pay the banks and money market funds not to release this liquidity back into the markets. And so again, as they raise rates, it actually is not, it's stimulative and not restrictive like you they would want you to believe. And obviously we've seen that. We're seeing AI, crypto, like, okay, the Fed's raised rates fastest pace since 1981 and we're off to the races. So obviously what they say on the tin is not what's actually happening. And also my view on this is, is like, Nobody gives a fuck about a five and a half percent hurdle rate when the asset goes up hundred or two hundred percent a year, right? It's just it's irrelevant, you know. If it's a secular trend like crypto or tech, interest rates don't really matter. Well, crypto and tech companies don't need banks, so who gives a fuck what their interest rate is? Apple can fund its capex, Google can fund its capex, Microsoft can fund its capex from retained earnings. The the price of money doesn't matter. But if you're some widget company in Ohio. Well, fuck, you're not getting any loans, especially not from a regional bank that's not too big to fail. No loans for you. You're fucking suffering. But you're not going to see that because no one cares about the S&P other than the seven companies that power all the returns, which 
are all tech stocks that don't need banks. And obviously crypto, the whole point of crypto is to disintermediate the TradFi banking system. Of course, we don't care if there's no credit from TradFi coming to crypto. There never was. So again, this whole notion that five and a half percent on Fed funds is restrictive is fugazi. Yeah, I totally agree. The other thing I think through is the Europeans as well. Like, you know, they are shit scared of the energy issue that they've got and they want to get to cheap cost of energy through green energy. And you've talked about, you know, energy is the key input into productivity, for example. I think the Europeans are going to end up stimulating on that side yet again to keep paying these bills to get them off Russian gas and other stuff. Uh, and that's that's another big net stimulus. I don't think people are even looking at. But you start to hear the Europeans making noises about this again, about starting to stimulate on that side. Yeah, I mean, I really, yeah, I think Europe's kind of just like bitch boys of the US and kind of irrelevant. Like, well, as long well, as you're rolling like <laughs> that. It's not irrelevant in the fact that their, their nominal GDP growth is just not enough to cover the debt payments. So the US yeah. kind of can do that, but Europe really can't. Um, yeah. And so that becomes a bigger issue. And in China's, you know, destroying their auto markets, like Germany no longer is a big, the largest auto exporter. Like it's, you know, obviously they're caught in the middle. No cheap energy and no final markets for their stuff. What are you going to do? So I don't know. And that's why I use the the global, the one we have at GMI, the global, global weekly liquidity. Because, you know, sometimes like 2016, 15, um, that was, the US was still flat. You know, the balance sheet wasn't growing, liquidity wasn't growing, but Japan and Europe were. And so there's different parts. It can be any one of the central banks. You know, the debasement comes from everywhere because they're all using a dollar-based system, essentially. Yeah. And they're all running the same theories and economics. They all believe the same stuff. They all went to the same schools, you know, regardless of what the, you know, their federal government preaches about communism and socialism and capitalism, whatever. They all do the same thing. So, yeah, you know, what's true for one is true for the all. It's in different flavor. My opinion on this is they actually know what they're doing. They know they're debasing the currency and they've all kind of agreed it. It's It seems, how do you think through that? Because we all say the central bankers are dumb. I'm not sure that's true. I think they know exactly what's going on. I don't think they're dumb. And I think more so the, the the politicians, right? If I'm a politician in any system and I have the ability to print money, what do I do? I give away free shit to people to for my, for their for their support, whether it's a you know one man one vote democratic system, or it's some sort of like fascist communist system. It doesn't really matter. At the end of the day. The per- people in charge promise the majority of the people who aren't that wealthy, like, hey, I'm going to do something for you. Now, they don't tell them I'm just going to print money and debase your currency to pay for it. But again, it's all the same game. There's nobody in the world, however many elections that are happening this year, except for maybe Argentina, which are like, hey, we've spent too much. We need to cut back on government services. We shouldn't be doing all these things. We're going to balance the budget. It's going to be tough, but we take our knocks now and the future is bright. No one's campaigning on that anywhere in the world. And so if that's not going to happen, then why would you stop? Yeah, my view on that is they don't want to blow up the baby boomer complex. You know, the great baby boomer complex is where all the savings are. They are baby boomers themselves. They don't want the equity market to go down because that's the collateral of the system. So they protect that lot and sacrifice everybody else in the entire system. Because a retiree, it's fine. You debase the currency, your equity, you know, your share portfolio goes up. You've got higher interest payments right now. They're all fine. It's everyone else is totally screwed in this. Yeah, but again, thankfully we have crypto, so we have there is a way out. So let's talk about that. So this crypto life raft. The regulators are kind of struggling still with letting it happen. They want to throttle it. How are you seeing the big picture play out of the regulation, the adoption, you know, and how governments allow it to happen and that kind of phasing. So there was a paper written by this guy at Columbia, Columbus, I can't pronounce his name. And it was co- about fiscal dominance. Basically, the federal government has issued so much debt, the the spending is so high versus the tax receipts that any sort of notion of independent central banking goes out the window and the central bank becomes a tool of the federal government to pay the bills, right? And if you think about what the problem is for the banking system is, okay, we know all this inflation is coming. We know that we're going to be forced to buy these bonds and we know that's going to ding our profitability. But 
there's this there's this escape raft and if called crypto and if people really latch onto this and they say hey why do i have these dollars euros yen yuan whatever let me go buy an asset that's outside of this whole system and then i'll just sit back and watch watch the fireworks that's not good for the banks they're not gonna make any money on that so you know what do they do starting in 2023 uh, all of a sudden you know the winkle clowns they try to get an etf approved for 10 years did did uh, did the Lord's work for ten years trying to get this ETF approved in the U.S. Still don't have one, by the way. And Larry Fink, within six months, gets an ETF. And so TradFi says, "Okay, this crypto thing works." There's obviously this zeitgeist of too much federal spending. I mean, Jamie Dimon rages on about it every fucking quarterly report. Oh yeah, the U.S. is spending too money. The U.S. is spending too much much money. Well, instead of them getting fucked by them being forced to buy bonds that are negative real yielding, well, let's have a product that we can throw our clients into and make fees that's still within the system. And that's why I think these ETFs are now being embraced, which is, hey, here's this crypto derivative. You don't actually get to use Bitcoin because you can't withdraw it. You can't even redeem it. You want to redeem, you get dollars back uh, in, in these ETFs, not Bitcoin. And so it's just a way to put all this these people who want to get into this crypto life raft, but don't want to put in the real work and deal with private keys and, you know, OPSEC and all the things. I mean, it's, it's annoying, but again, freedom isn't free. And here, here's this ETF. You can subscribe through with your retirement account, your pension fund. You can buy it on a stock exchange. You've got all these, you know, respectable looking folks selling this to you now saying this is a way to diversify against inflation. And the banking system is reaps fees. And we've seen how successful it's become. So I think there's going to be a Bitcoin ETF, an Ethereum ETF, a Solana ETF. Regardless of what any politician says, the banks know that this is their way to stave off the effects of being forced to buy these bonds that are bad deals for them. And also, the government quite likes it because the money's actually not leaving the system. It's not you and I you know, opening, you know, having our ledger and taking our money outside of the system, which is, you know, why... You know, when I saw the European mess back in 2012, that's what got me into into Bitcoin because I just wanted to be outside the system. But these people aren't, so they're just kind of renting the performance of it without leaving the system. And that's a nice way for the government to say, "Well, guys, you play in this, but it's going to stop them opening the Coinbase account and at least starting the journey." And it, and it's it's better to do it this way than to ban something because when you ban something, then people are like, "Oh, well, why are you banning it?" Maybe I want to have some of it. You know, look at the illegal narcotics trade around the world. You tell people they can't have some, they say, "No, I'm going to have it." Um, <laughs> <laughs> so why not just say, "Oh yeah, you want you want crypto? Oh, here's here's a BlackRock Fidelity, blah 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 ETF. It's safe. It's custodied, and you no, know, you know, your bank that you know and trust, blah blah blah. Come on in." So I think that is for some people their crypto thing. They want to take their fiat, trade crypto, and earn more fiat. Which again is fine. It's it's a choice that people get to make. But if you want to take your fiat and save it in something that's outside of the system, then you have to go and buy physical Bitcoin and deal with what the issues that come with owning physical Bitcoin. And for me, I know the government's probably thinking, "Great, we've got everybody contained." I actually think a bit reverse. It's a Trojan horse because once you start to learn about this space, as you know, you go down a very very deep and long rabbit hole. And you realize why you're doing it. And before you know it, then the ETF doesn't make sense for you anymore because you want to diversify. So how my mental model for these ETFs is we got crypto land and fiat world. And this is just a trade deal between the two. So hot money flows. If you think of VC as FDI and you think of this as hot money flows, you know, it's just a trade deal. For me, it's like this is as big a deal to me as China opening up after the WTO agreement, because we've got now a free trade agreement essentially between them. Well, relatively free. Yeah, I guess we'll see. We'll see how free it is. How how much what the price impact is. Are people actually going to like hold this stuff? If you know, we'll, we'll mark us down off to fifteen percent over the last two days. How is that going to affect the flows? How secular is this trend of cash coming into these ETFs? How much do people actually believe in this? You know, negative correlation thing and. Can they actually deal with the volatility? I don't know. We're going to find all this out about this new segment of the market and how they behave when they start seeing the, the real volatility that's been suppressed in TradFi for the last 40 years. So 
I think the jury is still out on the positive, how big the positive impact would be. I definitely believe that the banks love fees and this is a fee bonanza. It's an opaque, illiquid, illiquid market where the end customer, yeah, they don't care if they're paying a 2% spread if the thing goes up 30% in a quarter. They could give two fucks. But, you know, the bank trading desk is loving it. BlackRock's just shilling them all sorts of stuff. So I think there'll be as many ETFs as they can get out in this market as quickly as possible just to ramp up AUM and get those fees. Also, I think, I think they're praying that they're not allowed to give ETH yield because if they get the ETF out and they keep the yield themselves, I mean, that's a huge fucking bonanza because you get, they yeah. keep the 5% yield. It'd be great. <laughs> and, you know, they, they're greedy. They will take it, any opportunity. I know Fidelity's just filed today for the ETH, uh, to offer the yields, staking yields, but let's see. My guess is the SEC says, oh, it's too complicated, and Larry and everybody else will start printing cash and this kind of stuff, and, you know, People, people will realize. So as that money flows into crypto, into our world, in, into crypto land itself, what does it do to the risk curve? We've already started to see some sort of bananas price action as money starts getting recycled. So let's, let's talk through how, that, how that, the risk curve flows. Well, it's, it's a wealth effect, right? So you and I hold physical Bitcoin. We're like, oh, wow, we feel real rich. We got all these new people in pushing up the price. What else do you want to own in this space? And then you move to the ETH, and then you go to Solana, and then it's, you know all of a sudden you're, you're fucking trading Slurf or like Dog with Hat. <laughs> it's fun. It's just humans experimenting and playing games with each other that have monetary payouts on the internet. And I think it's a lot of fun. You know, obviously trade with responsibility and all that kind of stuff, but it's pure emotion. It's no central authority telling you what you can and what you can't do. Whatever someone wants to list, they just do it and it either succeeds or fails instantly. And I think that's super powerful. And it's and for the first time in a long time, people are having fun doing this thing called trading. And you know, some of it is, you know, tasteless memes, but whatever. But you've been on this whole thing about the memes and the power of memes and what it actually means to crypto for quite a long time. I think, you know, you and Meltem have probably been really early in identifying that this is a real thing. And these are cult, it's tokenized culture. And some of it might be fleeting, like Slurp might last a day or may last 10 years. Who knows? I mean, Doge, I mean, who the fuck thought Doge would survive? But it's still worth multi billions of dollars. Yeah. And the chains that can support this culture are going to be the chains of, that have value. So Solana, and, and I'm a big, bit of an ETH maxi in terms of who has the best decentralized internet computer. But at the end of the day, if the Solana price is going up because people are launching these meme coins on it and a new developer to this space says, oh, this is interesting. I would want to, I want to develop on Solana because I know I have users. Why, do, why does Solana have users? Well, it was a very easy platform, good UI UX to launch these dog money coins. And so it brought attention. So yes, you can you know poo-poo these things as stupid and valueless, but if it brings attention, if it brings more engineers to the space, then it's positive value for the chain itself. And also, look, the attention economy, we know we live in it. You know, we're all on Twitter. It's part of the attention economy. Somebody else gets to monetize us. Here's a different way of monetizing the attention economy. I mean, Dog with hat has got all the attention. They're going to put it on the fucking sphere in sphere. Vegas, right? It's <laughs> it's it's ridiculous and hilarious. But as you say, people get to write their own rules. They're not told by some bloke in a suit that they shouldn't be doing this. They know that everybody knows that this is ridiculous. It's not like oh, I got caught out by this mean coin thing. I thought they had value. Everyone knows they got no value, and it's a game of chance. But it's fun. Yeah, exactly. I mean, is gaming mentality writ large? Because if you think about that young, the younger crowd, I mean, they grew up on gaming. This is the same thing, but just gaming with money. Yeah, trading. I love it. I think it's just pure expression of human emotion. And if you're a big, you know, technical analysis person, this is probably the the best place to deploy those strategies because there isn't a central bank manipulating things. It's literally just a bunch of humans trading with each other, and that emotion is expressed in candlestick chart. It's 
beautiful as a trader. Although most of them don't have much price history, right? Because they launch and you, then you're trying to, so then you're down to one minute time horizon. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I think some people have been trading on the one second. People are crazy in crypto. So how do you, so how are you thinking kind of allocation wise of navigating the space? So you're mainly ETH orientated right now, you know, outside of the, we'll talk about the DGEN stuff in a sec, but just as a general kind of, you know, when I tell people as the t-shirt says, don't fuck this up, as part of it, it's just don't use leverage, have a core portfolio, it'll work. And then you can do whatever you want with the rest. How are you, what's your core positioning? So core position, obviously vast amounts of Bitcoin relative to everything else. Next is ETH, because I have one on the decentralized internet computer and I believe ETH. Ethereum is the best one at the current time. It's hilarious to uh, see the negative narratives on ETH right now. It's like, I mean, it's that's great. You want attention. At the end of the day, talk about it. Great. If you're not talking about it, then you're Cardano and you get zero. <laughs> <laughs> well, you talk about it, but it just doesn't do anything. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and then um, I hold positions in some uh, DEXs that pay good yields, right? Because again, you got to clip some coupons and make some money off of the trading fees that are happening in this ecosystem. So I would say that's my core position. And then, you know, I'll fuck around with, you know, throwing some some nickels at this and that just as, as like a short-term trading position. But I don't do a whole lot of trading, which thankfully I can do that because, again, I think that's a better fit for my lifestyle. I rarely I rarely ever trade. I love looking at the charts, but it's... it's, it's I've got, it's, I've it's, got it's, the it's hourly charts next to me on Bloomberg. I don't trade any hourly charts, but I, I look at them all the time. And occasionally when I'm really, really hitting FOMO, I'll start punting around in whiff or something like that just <laughs> just to be part of it. Exactly. And uh, what about on the on the VC side? Because you're doing that, are you mainly doing um, pre-token launch stuff or equity or a combo? So fuck equity, tokens only. Um, we don't really? really fuck with equity. Uh, I have a very high liquidity preference and I want my money back as soon as possible. It's great. That's why tokens are great. So, you know, I don't do any of the direct selection of the things that go in the portfolio. The, the, the person who runs that book does that. My role is more of the, the cycle perspective. Like, where are we in a cycle? So we started really ramping up allocations in like late 22 and early uh, 23. And my thesis is it's a bear market. Valuations have come down for projects. We need to be allocating as much as we can now because if we believe that the peak of the cycle is 25, 26, that's when we'll unlock our tokens and we're able to liquidate into you know, a rising price or maybe at the crest of, of the market. So we should be allocating as much as we can now. Now we've moved into the everyone believes in crypto again phase and all the funds that were sitting on the sidelines waiting are now deploying and therefore prices for you know pre-product, pre-protocol revenue projects are getting back to the frothy um, levels. And so I don't wanna participate in that. I don't wanna lock my money up for three years, miss the cycle and overpay. If it's a good project and it launches during this cycle, I'll trade it on a liquid basis, but I don't need to lock my money up for three years. And so now we're switching more to doing a lot more advisory stuff working with projects that we think um, are very capable. We may put a small check in, but the focus now right now is not on writing checks. We'll be back writing checks in 26, 27 when the market was now 95%. Yeah, we do the same. I've got an asset management firm that's a fund of hedge funds, so just crypto hedge funds. Just use the same thing. Use the top-down macro framework. Give us where, where we are in the macro asset allocation and then let the guys build the portfolio from the bottoms up. So right now we're like 10 out of 10 risk seeking because that's where we are in the cycle. You get the portfolio that way and it kind of, and it kind of works. And just you just have to navigate these cycles. You get it right. As you said, the worst thing is to have all your token unlocks happen in, in you know, late 2026. And you're like, really? <laughs> so, so, but again, it's different. Obviously, I have a different incentive structure than a a fund, which is a seven to 10 year life cycle. They have LPs. I want to charge them 2% management fees. They don't care if any of this shit unlocks. It'd be great if they have no marks because then nobody knows how shitty they are at outperforming. <laughs> that's right. But one thing that's really interesting about the uh, the token side of, of VC is this idea of these very short cycles. You know, It releases capital super fast to allocate capital fast. And I've been thinking through where AI is going. I just want to run this by you. 
So if you're looking at like Sam Altman disrupts everybody every three months and kind of nukes every AI business by introducing get something a mate, right? And I'm seeing, I actually think that the open AI using AGI to build their own business. So they're, there are only 500 people. How the hell can they iterate across 10 different products at that speed, right? It's not normal. So anyway, whether he is or not, but everyone's going to start using AI to build AI to build businesses so that the business cycle gets faster and faster. And many of these businesses will get disrupted. And this feels to me like the ICO market, where stuff, some stuff sticks, some stuff lasts a bit, and then gets disrupted or disappears. And I'm just thinking that the capital cycle is going to change for the, you know, and I'm starting to think, how are these VCs and private equity going to capture any value at all in the equity space over time because of what's about to happen? I guess you can see that well, on NVIDIA. This could be tokenized. <laughs> Why even try to like be smart about it? Like buy NVIDIA, buy AWS, walk and away. Buy crypto. I mean, yeah. why try to pick? Why why try to go to why go to Y Combinator to pick a startup that's going to be a zero in six months? Once you know some other person disintermediates them with a new product, it's tough. It's a really tough game. Of course, there will be these standout successes, and hats off if you're able to to know those. But I mean, I think I would love to see someone do the analysis. If you had a portfolio of Facebook and Google from like 2010 to 2020, how many Web two VC funds did you outperform with just those two stocks? Because literally all you do when you raise money in Web2 is hand up an advertising to Facebook and Google and maybe like landlords in fucking the Bay Area and San Francisco. Like a REIT, Google, Facebook, you probably beat almost 95% of VC funds. So in this cycle, is it AWS and NVIDIA if you're in the sort of, you know, TradFi stonk game? Will you probably going to outperform any of these like up and coming AI funds? Probably, I would imagine so. And so... I also wonder whether just owning Bitcoin has outperformed all of the crypto VCs. Except, well, the early stage token guys for sure have done really well because there's been some really good things. But it's actually pretty easy because crypto itself is like being an early stage VC or mid stage now, I guess. Yeah. And I, this is what I tell the guys at the fund all the time is our goal is you guys got to beat Bitcoin and ETH. Like, if why, why do you work here if you're going to underperform that? I can just buy that and hold it and go to the beach. So again, that's that's what we have to do. And you should always ask yourself if you're evaluating an opportunity like, oh, it's a really complicated crypto thing. And you know, the founder is doing this and that. Well, if you just bought Bitcoin or ETH, would you do better? At least ask yourself the question. So here's another thing I've, I've been thinking through that I want to run by you is I was at Beeple Studio in January. And like, everybody was anybody of all of the NFT artists were there, um, plus like MoMA, plus um, Sotheby's, Christie's, TradFi. It was a really interesting group. It was like 30 of us. And it, it made me suddenly have this lightning bolt moment. And you'll probably go through this as well. It's like, okay, end of this cycle, what the fuck do I do? Where do I put savings, long-term savings, right? In the TradFi economy, well, I'm... Worried about AI. I mean, tech stocks have been fine, but I'm worried about AI and the disruption. So I'm not really sure that they'll hold value over time. We don't know. Or it just accrues to some super companies. You know, crypto winters, I've gone through enough of them to not to want to keep going through it with all of my life savings, which is what I've been doing. And, and that's fine. I've been comfortable with that. But, you know, I'm starting to think about this. And I think a lot of people go through this, which is like, okay, I've made some real money out of this. How do I think about it? And once you've got a few houses, there's not much more you can do there. And it dawned on me that it's going to be the high end of NFTs. Because For some. Yeah, I, I just see that recycling of capital because it happens in the in the TradFi space. You know, As soon as Stevie Cohen gets rich enough or Noam Goddard's Mamel boss gets rich enough, all of them, they all end up buying art because they don't need any more fucking $100 million houses because they've... They've got enough of them, so they end up buying art, and it becomes their big storage of wealth. And I'm just thinking, I think we're likely to see that play through again. Um, and it's really, so I've actually just been buying just um, high-end NFTs, kind of ex-copy, because I think he's like, that's the culture. He was very early, him and Beeple were like really early with internet culture, tokenized um, 
So I'm just thinking through that. Have you are you an NFT person at all? I mean, I have a few punks. I've got an ape. You know, some of the major projects. I think I have the same question to myself as well. I've come to a bit of a different conclusion, which is, what's the goal of what all this? What we're doing, right? We want to grow our energy purchasing power over time. We have a lifestyle. We like it. We want to continue to have that lifestyle over time, right? So and what is money? It's just energy in an abstracted form. So if the unit of money gets to such a ridiculous value versus the underlying energy, which it's supposed to represent, then shouldn't I just buy the underlying energy assets? Maybe I should buy a power plant or ExxonMobil or something like that. Because at the end of the day, if I own the primary way that powers the computers that, that power the data centers that the AI is on, that power the foundries that make the chips, that power the miners that upkeep the network, and I own that primary energy source, and I've got it at a cheap price relative to the monetary asset that it's supposed to, that it's supposed to represent, then that's a great opportunity. And so I, that's what I'm thinking about is how do I own yeah, some that's primary a lot energy assets? To do than, that's a lot harder than, to do than buying a Beeple and stick it in my wallet. <laughs> yeah, but no one said it's being, you know, having the greatest returns are easy. Fuck that shit. <laughs> Got to do the hard work. So Elon actually said something that's interesting about this energy thing, because I'm a big believer that energy costs are going to collapse over time um, just from technology and because everybody's focused on it. And if you lower energy cost, productivity goes up. It's a multiplier. And so that solves a lot of the problems of what we're doing. Elon yesterday was just talking about, okay, the next issue is not the chips anymore. It's now the transformers. It's like changing energy from power plants to chip, you know, and and for the AI model, he's like, that's the biggest bottleneck in the world that's coming. And then it's electricity itself, which is to your point, is like the more of this stuff we scale, there's just simply not enough electricity. And so there's going to be a lot of disruption. Really interesting to see that Microsoft went down the path of, well, fuck it, we'll build a nuclear power plant. Yeah. I mean, that's, which is to your point, they're investing in energy. Who would have thought Microsoft would be thinking about energy, but they are. Yeah, that's why I own CCJ. I love, I love the uranium. <laughs> you know, it's, it's the only scalable you know, energy source outside of hydrocarbons that makes any sense from a density perspective that is here today. Now, obviously, who knows what is invented in our lifetimes. But right now, nuclear, we have not done anything. We have not scratched the surface on how useful nuclear could be to our existence as human civilization. And so I'm super bullish on on nuclear and sort of like the feedstock like uranium and that kind of stuff. Yeah, I mean, I was listening again last night to Lex Fridman interviewing Sam Altman. Same thing. He's like, if we want to win the AI arms race, even as a nation, there's no way of doing it without nuclear energy. There's literally just no way because it's it's the densest form of energy that we've got, and we just fucked the whole thing up. And if we solve this, we're going to solve a lot of problems. Yeah, for sure. I agree. Problem is, is Exxon and all the others don't want that to happen. This is always the, uh, the well, we'll see. We'll see who you know how all these assets start changing hands and who invests in what. But I mean, at the end of the day, we still don't have a lot of the delivery mechanisms ready. So hydrocarbons still make a lot of sense. You've built this infrastructure over the last, you know, century and a half. There's still useful stuff there to build enough nuclear power plants fast enough. It's going to take a time. It's going to take time. It's not like hydrocarbon, you know, oil and gas companies are going out of business anytime soon. They have a long, long way to go in terms of profitability and usefulness. Yeah, absolutely. So what else is, what's really got your attention right now? What are you looking at? Is it just the cycle and we're just going into the crazy zone, so just strap in and enjoy it? What's cool? Where, where are you in your head right now? Don't make it too complicated. It's very, very simple, right? We're, we've gotten... Don't fuck this up. <laughs> we've spent all this time pontificating about debt and demographics and money printing and blah, blah, blah. And we're at the end of the road. We're, you know, we've, you know, the fourth turning, right? The four generations since World War II, they're all dead. So nobody has any institutional memory of all the fucked up shit we did as a, as a world in World War II, and we're doing it all again. And so we know what's going to happen. We've, you know, if you've studied enough history, every civilization that can print its own money always abuses it. It doesn't fucking matter you know, what the ism is that they supposedly believe. They all do the same thing. We're at this point. We've, we've, we believe in our minds that this is what we should be doing in this crypto thing. So then 
buy it, hold it, strap in, and stop fucking whining. Uh, this is it. <laughs> That's right. I mean, I say that to people because I see people like arguing about the Federal Reserve and blah, blah, blah. I'm yeah. like, you've got the fucking answer. Just do that. And that it's all solved. You don't need to complain about it. In fact, you can be grateful because it outperforms the balance sheet. You know, I look at the global debasement. It's about 10% a year plus the inflation rate, so whatever it is. Um, but, you know, crypto on, on average does about 100% a year, even if you take into account the down cycles. You're getting more than compensated. It's the best. It's like an alien asset class when it comes to risk reward. <laughs> it's fucking alien. You've seen that chart. I think I posted yesterday on Twitter, Yuri and Timmer's chart. There's like all the risk reward of all of the major asset classes. It's like NASDAQ looks pretty good and gold is pretty crappy and whatever. And then there's this white space on the sheet. So they're all clustered down there. White space, white space, white space, white space Bitcoin. It's like it's a total alien. We've never had an asset that performs like this in all of history. And the risk-adjusted return is like any other asset we've ever been given. And, and people want to spend all day complaining on Twitter. I'm like, it's a gift. It's here. It's been given to you. Just take it. Lord, Soso Lord Satoshi, as you would say, has given you the gift. Just take it. Yeah, it's very simple. You know, Don't use any leverage. Hold it. I mean, if you want to trade it, trade it. It's fun. And... You know, I'm a trader and I really enjoy these markets. But yeah, it's just like constantly reminding yourself, keep it simple. And obviously, because I run my own portfolio, then it's like, okay, well, what other things can we build in this ecosystem to actually build like a parallel financial system? And that's obviously super exciting to see what, you know, younger people are creating of like, how do I reimagine uh, an interest rate swap? Or how do I reimagine how to do, do, do this trading? Or how do I reimagine how to do self-sovereign identity or whatever it is that you're into in sort of the the DeFi space, I think is super cool. Like all these experiments are being run. Of course, it's risky, but it's exciting. It's interesting. It's progress, hopefully. I'm getting really interested, and you'll understand this as well. When I heard about Firedance, I was like, Solana, great. I had a bunch, and then I just went kind of all in for this cycle when I learned about Firedancer. What's Firedancer? I'm, I'm, not, I'm not. Okay, this, you'll, you'll like this. So I'm like, I'm at Masari Mainnet, and firstly, Colleen from Brevin is on stage talking. She's like, oh, yeah, and then Firedance is coming. We think this is a really big deal. You know, we know the jump trading team really well. I'm like, I don't know, but Colleen's smart, so I'll listen to her. And then Tolly was on talking about Firedancer, and he's dropped the line. Well, you know, theoretically, Solana's 65,000 TPS, but... Jump Trading have developed a validator that is 1.2 million TPS. And it's just a version of Solana. So it's not a different token or anything else. It's just one of the validator nodes of, of Solana. Now, so Jump, they, they got this guy, and I, I went down the rabbit hole. The guy's like a fucking nuclear physicist or whatever. And he's just like, well, we, we're a high-frequency trading firm. So the only thing we solve for is speed of light. Because, you know, it's all fiber optic cables. It's just how close can you get to the exchange and how fat is the cable? That's their entire game. So he's like, well, we want crypto rails. So we've just built something fast enough. So they rebuilt it. And even Tolly's like, okay, this is exactly what we should have done. So it's a complete step change. So it's in testnet right now. It goes to mainnet sometime this year, later on Q3. But I think this is finally the ability to build exchanges on blockchain rails in a way that you can have market making, high frequency trading, all of the things that you need to create massive pools of liquidity. That got me really interested because that's a complete step change. Yeah, that's interesting. I mean, I'm of the opinion that order books are nice, but I do like the AMM model because it's very simple. And if you're trying to onboard a few billion people who, even, even when they look at a stock app in traditional finance, are like, what the fuck is this? I don't understand this bid and ask. And what is it here? Here, just buy and sell it. There's no order book. This is a pool of magic liquidity and all that you get. Uh, it spits out a price. And I think I like that. I like that's very native to our space. It's easy to use, can onboard the long tail of people onto trading whatever it is they want to trade. And adding liquidity is just adding, you know, A and B asset to a pool. So I actually like the AMM model. I know it's simple. I know it doesn't require a lot of um, TPS speed to execute, but I think it fits with the type of person who is drawn into this, who doesn't have the access to a Robinhood or one of these. Yeah, like, but I'm more thinking grabs. about onboarding TradFi. 
you know, that that other use case is we need to get rid of these old crappy rails and put it onto new rails. Just feels like, okay, this is an interesting potential way forward because it's being built for that purpose. It's like, okay, that's interesting to me. Um, and let's see what applications could, that could be built from it. So that, that that's the one thing that really got my focus. And I think they'll become a much bigger narrative later this year. Let's see whether anybody builds enough on it this cycle or whether it's the next cycle thing, right? Because it's early stage technology. Um, yeah, so I, I guess the key message from both of us is not to fuck this up, is just keep it simple, stupid. How do you stop yourself FOMOing? Or you just keep yourself a degen bag and allow yourself to get carried away. If I want to, if I want to FOMO, I, I, the size of the position that I'm trading is so small relative to my overall stack that even if I lose 100 percent of the money, I don't care. And so I think that's how you do it. So if you want to FOMO in and and your day job is not being on these messaging boards, knowing what the hot thing is, like if you're buying dog with hat two weeks after the fact and you heard about it then don't be a full-time DJ and crypto trader because you're not in the know. You need to discover that shit, you know, when it was like 1% of the value that it is today because you were in the mess the rooms, you knew the developers, you were in that community. If that's your game, then yeah, trade it away. But if you, if you heard about Dog With Head on Bloomberg and then you went and bought it and found out you lost 50% in the next tick, well, that should tell you all you need to know. <laughs> Yeah, I think, you know, I t tell people you know, your DGEN bag should be kind of no more really than 10% of your overall, but I don't think I even get there because, I, you know, there's so much value to be I mean, had if you, you if, just, you, if you get it right, then you know, the thing goes up 100x. Why do you need to put that much chips on the table? You're not trying to change your life with any of these coins. It's like, it's fun. It can make a little bit of money, but man, you'd be real pissed at yourself if you fucking nuked your whole stack <laughs> on some like but, on but Slurf token. <laughs> yeah, all of a sudden hilarious. you can't and now you can't invest in any of the what you consider the high quality cryptos that are gonna you know be around for the next you know centuries hopefully but there is a mentality from people right they're not you know not as lucky as you and i we both you know came from finance where you got paid and then you built a great business and all of this stuff where they think they can only see the 100x as their opportunity they think i've got five grand i might as well go for the 100x because what's the point of holding Bitcoin and making 5x. And I kind of yeah. get their point, right? They feel fucked over anyway. So what do they do? I mean, and that's kind of the pernicious effects of inflation is you become sure. a speculator. You become a gambler because that's the only way that you, you have light at, light at the end of the tunnel to change your situation in a time frame that's palatable to you. The unfortunate fact is you're just going to have to suffer. Like the only way to get success is to suffer. And so if suffering means you go for the safer option, but your stack keeps building versus you did what I have you do to get that little bit of money, you blew it on trying to go for the thousand X when you could have gone for the safer option. Yes, you wouldn't be able to, when it wouldn't have been able to quit your job if you were hit it right on, on the safer, whatever it is but at least you're in the game to play again versus starting way back at, at zero again, still in debt, still you know, have a job that doesn't keep up with inflation in terms of your wage. That's the message that people need to hear. I know it's not a very sexy message. There is no easy button. The person you saw on TikTok and Twitter who like, you know, was working at McDonald's and now has a Lamborghini, that's great for that person. That ain't you. Don't believe that that's gonna happen to you. Yeah, and you also see it a lot. Yeah, we've seen it a lot with meme coin season is that of all of the thousands of people you may see in your Twitter feed, you'll see one person who got whiff right and one person who got bonk right. And, one, and you think, oh my God, they're all making money. No, no, net, net, most people aren't making a lot of money out of this. It's not fucking easy. Yeah, exactly. So if you want to be a full-time trader, then you need to be a full-time trader. It's not, I get home from work tired and I'm going to sit on the computer for an hour or two and think I'm going to make some money. No, you... Your ass needs to be staring at that screen all day long and become an expert in whatever it is that you're trading. So I think that's the message that people need to hear. It's not a very sexy message. Most people don't want to hear that, but that's the truth. Any of the traders you lionize in the books and all that kind of stuff, they put in a lot of hours and a lot of hard work. And if you ask them very minute things about the markets they trade, they know everything about it. Yeah. there is, As you said before, making money is not easy. If it is, you're likely to lose it just as quick. Yeah. It takes time, takes a lot of hard work. 
Arthur, as ever, fantastic to chat to you. And uh, we'll get together in, in Dubai. Yeah, I think, see you in Dubai. Yeah, it's going to yeah, be a rocking party. <laughs> oh, yeah, it's going to be a lot of fun. A lot of fun. Can't wait. Thank but you. Anyway, good to see you. And we'll talk soon. Cheers. Arthur preaching the don't fuck this up idea, which I thought was uh, really powerful and very useful. Even though Arthur may appear like a degen often on Twitter, you know, he, he, he saw the meme economy rising. He's kind of got his pulse on this. But when you hear how he manages his own money, he's much more cautious. Well, cautious, we're in a very risky asset class. Well, risky meaning risk-seeking asset class. Um, but he doesn't really mess around. He doesn't want to lose his money. Now, I understand most people don't have as much money as Arthur. Arthur's done very well in this business. But it is he is right. It is the right route. Um, thinking about how you asset allocate in this mother of all macro trends, the greatest macro opportunity of all time. So do your best not to fuck this up. So don't use leverage. Allocate 90% of your portfolio, 80 or 90% of your portfolio to just the stable, high quality stuff. That's that's Bitcoin, ETH, Solana. Those are really the three you need right now. I understand some of you might like different crypto, but they don't have the network effects. These are the three proven ones with network effects of that scale. And then keep everything else smaller. Don't FOMO into stuff. Don't just follow it because somebody else has made money in it. Now, expect that 10% bucket to go to zero because most people are shit at this and I I'm shit at it uh, too. So I do it for a bit of fun just because if not, you're just doing literally absolutely nothing. And that is the magic, the compounding of doing nothing in crypto means extraordinary returns. Anyway, I hope you enjoyed the interview. Um, go to realvision.com. I mentioned it before because I, as Arthur said, making money is not easy. You have to do your homework. And we built Real Vision for people like you who are trying to figure this out, however advanced you are. There is a community, there's the knowledge and the tools there for you. So go to realvision.com. Also, as I mentioned before, I'd appreciate it if you subscribe to the channel because uh, that helps me and the YouTube algorithm. Obviously, comments and stuff like that really helps as well. So listen, appreciate your time as ever, and I'll bring you somebody amazing next week. See you then. Kraken Pro is the powerful crypto platform for experienced traders who demand the best. With advanced charts, real-time market analytics, and lightning-fast trade execution, Kraken Pro empowers you to trade your way. Customize your setup and make every pixel count by rearranging and stacking trading modules in a way that makes sense to you. On Kraken Pro, you have the freedom to put your favorite market analytics and execution tools exactly where you need them. And whether you're a seasoned pro or just starting out, Kraken Pro has everything you need to navigate over 210 plus assets with confidence. Join the thousands of seasoned traders who trust Kraken Pro. Visit realvision.com slash Kraken Pro. We hope you enjoyed the video. At Real Vision, we help you understand the complex world of finance, business, and the global economy with in-depth analysis from real experts. Join the revolution at realvision.com.